Welcome to this week's GCN Tech Clinic. I'm going to follow the same format as I do every week, so let's dive straight into our first question. So this week our first one is from Dave, who says, We bought a used tandem and I'd like to carry spare quick links for each chain. There are two. Thanks for letting us know that, Dave. Um, in case we have a problem when we're out riding and a long way from home. How can I figure out which quick links to buy? I believe the type of chain and the width matters. Yep, that is correct. The width of your chain is referring to the speed it is. So it could be six speed, seven speed, eight speed, nine, 10, 11, 12, and there's even 13 speed chains. So that's what you need to do. Make sure to get a quick link that matches up to the speed of chain that's fitted onto the bike. And it's also good practice to buy it from the same brand that's compatible with what's fitted onto your chain. So that could be SRAM, Shimano, or Campagnolo. But something to bear and bear take mind of, I suppose, is whether um, the quick link that you're buying is single use or reusable, because some of them is recommended only to use once and then discard them and use a new one. Whereas I would advise get in a quick link that can be used multiple times, and some of them are even sold in packs of two. So there you go, that should help, uh, help solve your problem. Next question in is from Tim. So he says, I've seen multiple videos on TikTok showing bikes drivetrains that were so smooth, the cranks never stopped spinning once the wheel was freewheeling. So my question is, what bearings do they use? And thanks. Well, Tim, unfortunately, I don't know what type of bearings were in the bike in the exact video that you watched. It would be incredible if I did, wouldn't it? But anyway, the, I think the reason you've seen that could be for a number of different reasons. Firstly, it will be that the bearings in the system have got very minimal friction. So it could be that they're ceramic bearings. It could be that they've got incredibly thin grease or oil fitted inside. But one of the biggest differences is what seal is fitted to the bearing, whether it's low drag, non-contact, or it might even have no seals whatsoever. That will make it have very little friction inside as it's spinning. It could also just be a normal high quality steel bearing that's got thin grease or oil and again, a low contact bearing, uh, a seal, sorry. So the other reason that you might see this happening is slightly less exciting and doesn't involve any exciting bearings. And it could just be that the free hub itself is exerting a bit of drag into the system. And as such, when you spin the wheel, the force is just being converted through the free hub into the cassette and then just turning the pedals and the chain all the way around. So a slightly less exciting reason for it, but something to bear in mind. So when you see the, the crank spinning around nice and freely, it's not always an indicator that all the bearings are running silky smooth. Right, next question in is from Cycle Vlogger. They say, hey, I'm a big fan of your channel. And my question is that I'm gonna buy a Carbon, double O in carbon, um, bike which has Ultegra Di2. But I have a doubt that mechanical Ultegra is better, or is it the Di2 that's better? Thanks. Um, well, it really depends on what you define by better. So if you're someone that defines better, meaning that it's a lower cost or represents a better value for money, then maybe the mechanical Ultegra is the better option because it is significantly cheaper than the Di2. But in my opinion, I think it is worth spending that little bit of extra cash to try to get a Di2 equipped group set. In my example, or my preference, I think that the shifters make such a big difference in the size of them, especially if you're going to use a disc brake group set. Having Di2, the shifters have got a much smaller body and just look a lot more slimline and a bit neater and tidier on the bike. And also in terms of maintenance, a Di2 system, provided you charge it up every now and again, is pretty much fit and forget and you shouldn't have any maintenance issues to, to worry about. So I would suggest if you can get Di2, go for it. It certainly isn't crucial, but it's a worthy upgrade in my opinion. Next question in is from David. So he says, surely if looking for max, max marginal aero gains, from an almost imperceptibly staggered set of rims, the deeper section wheel should be on the front where it might actually make a difference. Maybe. And um, then they say, which would be more effective, a 10 millimeter deeper rim or a two millimeter skinny tire? Well, firstly, thanks for your question. And to confirm, I 100% didn't have to double check what imperceptibly means. Um, yeah, I didn't Google that. Anyway. Um, as you say, the difference between the rim depths of say 10 millimeters or so isn't really gonna make the slightest bit of difference in terms of, 
all out aerodynamic drag. Certainly no difference. I don't think you'd be able to tell when you're out riding the bike. The difference in height, I think, might be noticeable in a crosswind situation when the wind's hitting the wheel from the side and then that deeper wheel will catch that wind a little bit more. But in terms of where you're saying, where would it be more effective? I think a front wheel does have a big impact on the aerodynamic characteristics of the bike. And it could be like we've seen examples in the summer where we've had big teams such as Jumbo Visma or Team Ineos moving away from some of their wheel sponsors and using a specially designed front wheel for time trial situations. They've used wheels like the, the AeroCoach um, time trial front wheel, which has fancy aerofoil hubs and all sorts of fancy bits on it because the front wheel does make a big difference. Now onto the other part of your question where you're saying what would be more effective, a 10 millimeter deeper rim or a two millimeter skinny tire? That's a tough question. I don't actually know the answer to that off the top of my head but I would be inclined to say that using a slightly narrower tire on the front would have a bigger difference aerodynamically than a slightly deeper rim. Because it's hitting the wind at the front of the bike, you want the front to be as narrow as possible. But um, yeah, I've not tested it, and that's just the answer off the top of my head. So, next question is from Abner, who says, Hey, Alex, man on an ollie. You guys rock. Oh, thanks very much, it's really kind. Um, for my question, have there been any studies on disc brakes pulling to one side since both rotors are on the same side of the bike? I know it would probably be minimal, but is it measurable? Um, it seems like it would be. Do you have any thoughts? Um, well, I'm not aware of any studies that have tested the amount of force that's put through a bike because both of the disc brakes are on the left-hand side. But in theory, and the sort of common sense approach to it would suggest that applying the force through the brakes on one side would have an impact on the bike. Now, if it's not significant, it's not something I think you should be worried about, but the force is different because you are applying it on one side. And as such, you'll see disc brake wheel sets have, well, they tend to have more spokes on one side of the wheel where the disc rotor is, and it's also laced up slightly differently. So the spokes are crossed over each other to add a little bit of strength into the wheel on that side. A while back, we did see some mountain bikes, particularly downhill bikes, using a dual front disc brake, so a rotor and a caliper on each side of the wheel. This was to give them a little bit of added power and also to combat that slight twisting force that you're talking about where you have the brake on one side. But that system was incredibly heavy compared to a single rotor and caliper. And for a road bike, certainly, would completely mess up the aerodynamics, having all of that extra stuff added in. So I think, I haven't seen any studies, I don't think it's something you should worry about. And in terms of using a dual caliper to, over, to overcompensate or account for that force, I don't think we're likely to see that on a road bike. It's more something for, for motorbikes, which have a lot more force going through them. Next question in is from Mark. They say, hey GCN team, I bought a new road bike but the seat post is still too high even when adjusted into its lowest position. Is it possible to cut the seat post to lower it even more? Yeah, you can cut seat posts, especially if it's an aluminium one, it's super easy to cut. Measure it, always measure twice, cut once. Basic rule of engineering and mechanics, otherwise you'll cut it wrong. Anyway, if it's aluminium, measure it carefully, then cut the section off the end. But what you need to be mindful of is if you were to cut 10 millimeters off the end of your seat post, the minimum insertion marker will need to move 10 millimeters further up the seat post to ensure that you have the same amount of seat post left in the frame. Um, but you're not gonna put the seat post up to the highest limit, so it shouldn't really matter for you. And if you've got a carbon fiber seat post, it can be cut down just the same sort of process and there's an aluminum one, but you need to use a saw blade specifically designed for cutting carbon fiber. And you need to be very careful not to fray the end of the seat post when you're cutting it. And also, you don't want to be breathing in any of that carbon fiber dust. So it's worth using a little bit of lubricant so there's less dust created. And also wear a mask so you don't breathe any of that dust in. There you go. Next question in is from Leighton who says, road bikes have 11 to 32 cassettes or his road bike, presumably, um, and the Smart Trainer has an 11 to 28 tooth cassette. Should I put the 32 tooth on the trainer or leave it be? What are the pros and cons? Oh, this is a question we've seen a number of times on the tech clinic over the last few weeks. People having different cassettes to their Smart Trainers or indoor trainers. Um, I wouldn't worry about changing the cassettes over. 
yes, they are different, and what you do need to be mindful of is Oh no, actually in that instance it should be fine because the chain will be slightly longer on your bike, so you don't need to worry about it. But if you were going the other way around, so you had the larger cassette on your smart trainer, then you would need to be mindful if you used the large chain ring and the large sprocket on the back. But in this instance, having a smaller cassette on the trainer should make no difference whatsoever and you wouldn't need to worry about it. So leave it be and don't worry. Next question in, and I think this is our last question for this week's GCN Technic. It's from Cam who says, Hey, GCN's best tech expert. Oh, fantastic. I hope that was aimed at me and you didn't think this was going to Ollie. I'd be a bit upset if it was. Anyway, um, recently I had to remove my aluminium chain suck guard after an incident since it um, rotated around the plate. It was meant to be stuck onto the carbon fiber frame with double-sided tape. But their question is, can I glue it with a two-part epoxy or should I look for a thin and strong double-sided tape, are both options safe? Um, both options are safe. You, all you really need to do is to stick that plate onto the frame. However, I would be inclined not to look to use a, a resin or an epoxy to glue that on because if at any stage later on you need to remove that plate, be it that you maybe get your frame repaired or painted, or even that that plate gets damaged again, it's gonna be incredibly difficult to remove it and you do run the risk of damaging the paintwork and even maybe the, the frame if it's stuck on, on that well. So I would suggest cleaning the area up, clean the new plate up with some disc brake cleaner or isopropyl alcohol and then get some double-sided mounting tape that will stick that on and keep it in place. I certainly would uh, avoid epoxying it on otherwise you'll never be removing it ever again. Um, that's it, last question in. All done for this week's Tech Clinic. Hope you've enjoyed it and found it helpful. And if I haven't got to your question, well, I apologize and keep submitting it in the comment section down below. And hopefully I'll get to it in a few weeks, right? See you later.